So this is what I'm telling you. With the mathematical tools that we are introducing, all of this gets a lot simpler. So I said that I will do this circuit three different ways, right? This is the first method. It took, um, well, a half of the class or something like that. Uh, what I'll show you is the second method, which is actually a very simple improvement from using a real function to complex function. Already simplifies my work a lot. So let me, um, so I think I'm actually going to leave a lot of the expressions in place and I'll just make modifications. Um, modifications for using this complex input voltage v naught times e to the i omega t and looking for a complex current as my answer. Okay? So the so you know when I use complex functions as my input and output, um, my differential equation doesn't change. It's still the same differential equation I'll use. It's still the same differential equation here I'll use. But the solution I look for that will no longer be this. Instead, it'll be the complex version of this. Uh, so it'll be the current as a function of time is i naught times e to the i omega t. But I learned my lesson from last time. I should include a phase factor. It, it, it would be e to the i omega t plus phi. And by the way, this being a complex function means that, um, wait, do I want to do it? Yeah, yeah, this being a complex function means actually I have a way of writing this down in a simpler way than I could. The, uh, I could do the, 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 the real trigonometric functions. So the, I can write this down this way. I can do the exponential algebra and take out this phi as a multiplicative factor and say that this is equal to i naught times e to the i phi times e to the i omega t. Everyone okay with this expression here? Yeah, yeah I just, uh, so this is a, a nicer expression because I have a very simple looking time dependent function and this is now just a simple constant. Uh, this alone will save a lot of uh, unnecessary work. So let me plug this in into the, my differential equation and rewrite my left-hand side. So my left-hand side would be, instead of having i naught, it'll be i naught times e to the i phi. So i naught times e to the i phi. And when I take the derivative of this complex exponential, e to the i omega t. Uh, from chain rule, I get this factor of i omega. So instead of minus sign here, I would get factor of i omega. For the, oops, uh, instead of minus omega, I had to get a factor of i omega um, here from chain rule. Good. This is the left-hand side. Um, it, I don't know, to me this looks simpler. <laughs> okay, so that's the left hand side. Let me uh, do the right hand side and see if we can figure out if those two terms should be equal to each other. So the right hand side is this. So, oh, I uh, forgot to make this replacement in, um, in place. So this cosine of omega t should have been e to the i omega t. So the right hand side here will be v naught over L, so this doesn't change. Cosine of omega t becomes e to the i omega t. And uh, this term here becomes minus r over l times i naught e to the i phi, e to the i phi. This is phase factor. And this is the place where you see why we call it phase factor, not phase addition. Um, and then the i is a function of time again. So e to the i omega t. Good. So the, it's, a, it's a here where you can already see that this cuts down on a lot of the work that we had before. 
I no longer need this trigonometric um, identity because I can simply see that all three terms have the common factor of e to the i omega t. So whereas cosines and omegas didn't cancel, e to the i omega t cancels. It's the same function that occurs in all three terms. So I can cancel out e to the i omega t from each one of these terms. And what used to be all the complicated expression of separating a cosine omega t term, sine omega t term, and working it all out, it simply becomes the question of, is this complex number equal to this complex number? So let me write that out. So the two complex numbers we are trying to compare are these. I omega i naught e to the i phi, uh, i omega i naught e to the i phi, is this equal to v naught over L times, oh sorry, not times, minus r times i naught over L e to the i phi. All right, it feels like I, uh, let's, can I solve for I naught? Yeah, I think I can, so here I can solve for I naught without ever needing to solve for e to the i phi. Uh, let me show you how. So I naught is equal to, uh, let me just uh, move this term over here. Um, yeah, let me, I'm already going to do something that's a little bit sophisticated, so let me not skip steps. Let me move this over and then combine the like terms. Then I get I naught times I omega e to the I phi plus R e to the I phi over L. R e to the I phi over L. That is equal to, uh, well, phi naught over L. Let me uh, solve this for I naught. And then I'll show you a mathematical trick that you can use to um, solve for I naught without ever solving for phi. So this is equal to um, I naught, or this becomes I naught is equal to phi naught over L over all of this quantity. My, uh, not minus, I omega e to the i phi plus R e to the i phi over L. Okay. Now, um, here it looks like the i naught depends on phi, right? And um, you remember from before that i naught here didn't depend on phi. So let me give you a, uh, tell you a little trick that will help you solve for i naught independently of phi without ever actually having to solve for phi. It has to do with understanding some properties of complex numbers. So you know we started out with a complex uh, function, guessing a complex uh, function answer. So here's my question: Is this i naught a complex number or a real number? Yeah, it's a, a bit of a tricky question to answer. Okay, let me rephrase the question. Can I choose my parameters in such a way that this i naught will be a real number? Yeah, I can do that. It essentially comes down to the correct choice of phi, so that this uh, particular complex number that's here, it's the complex number written in polar form, with i naught being the magnitude, and e to the i phi having all the you know, cosine theta plus i sine theta term in it. So I can make a correct choice of phi that'll make my i not be real. So let me say, my i not is it's a real number. Yeah? So once you know that, then this is what I can say. Uh, if I take i not absolute value squared 
that this should be equal to simply i naught squared. Right? Now, with the real number, these two are indistinguishable. They don't have any different meaning. But some of you might remember the difference in meaning between if you have a complex number z, if you take its absolute value squared, that's not going to be necessarily equal to simply z squared. Do people remember that? As in, you know, imagine you have complex number z equal to a plus ib. You do get a different result, whether you take what's called modulo squared versus you simply square the complex number. This should be covered in your trigonometric class. How many of you uh, remember the distinction between these two for a complex number? OK, some of you, but not enough of you. OK, let me just show you the difference. I mean, this is something you have to understand at some point. The, um, I mean, there's almost no upper division level work you can do um, in engineering with a poor understanding of complex numbers. It's something you have to catch up on at some point. So if you simply take g squared, this is what you get. Um, well, let me take this and simply square it. Then I get a squared uh, plus this thing squared. So that will be i squared, b squared, i squared is minus 1. So it's a squared minus b squared. And then I have the cross terms. So it's going to be plus 2i plus two i times a times b. This is unsatisfactory in many different ways. Uh, here's the, one of the things that's uh, very um, unsatisfactory. This minus b squared means it's possible for g squared to become to be ne a negative number. Imagine my g is equal to simply ib. You square it, you get minus b squared. So my g squared can be a negative number. Um, and this term here means that my g squared is uh, um, it, it, it's a complex number. Squaring it didn't get rid of i's because of this cross term. So because of this, people invented um, this absolute value squared operation, which is different from simple square. And the way this should have been introduced to you is that this absolute value squared is the complex number times, not with itself, but it, with something called a complex conjugate. How many here remember phrase complex conjugate? Yeah. It, um, well, maybe, you know what, in trigonometry, I'm not sure if you actually talk about complex conjugate. You might, you might not, I'm not sure. Um, so this is a p quantity uh, formed by you look at g, and wherever you see i, you turn it into minus i. And this will give you a quantity that's guaranteed to be positive, and this is a more important part, real. So let me just uh, do the calculation as an example so that you see. Uh, uh, let me do it here. The complex conjugate times g is equal to, so it's a complex conjugate minus ib. Minus ib times a plus ib, that gives you, well, a squared, and then minus i squared b squared, so that will be plus b squared, and the cross terms cancel. a times ib minus i times this, so they cancel. So this it gives you quantity that's a squared plus b squared. So this is the... Um, you can even look at this this way. This is the length of the thing that you draw as a vector on a complex plane. If you have a complex number g represented on a complex plane, what you get by com computing this quantity is the, uh, the length squared. Okay. So, so we are going to use this fact. If uh, i naught is a real number, so when I take this absolute value squared, I'm simply going to get i squared. But this right-hand side is a complex number. So when I do the proper complex modulo squared operation, then I will get a number here that's hopefully going to end up being real. And I'll be able to associate with i naught squared. And all I'll have to do is take a square root to get my final answer. So let's do that. So. 
Um, well, so, so I do modulus, let me do it in different color. I've been using red, okay. So I'll do modulus squared for both sides. So left-hand side is very simple, nothing complicated. It's simply I naught squared. Right-hand side, I have to write it down with a little more care. And I'll just go through algebra carefully so that you can see it becomes what I hope it will be. So it's, uh, uh, the numerator, I'll just do it as it is. I don't have to, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, it's a real numerator, so I can just say numerator is a V naught squared over L squared divided by, and so this denominator that I have to be careful with. So let me write down the complex conjugate first. The complex conjugate is, so for the complex conjugate, it's really a simple idea. Wherever you see i, turn it into minus i. And make sure that any number, any uh, symbols you see are real numbers. Omega is real, R is real, L is real. So all I have to do is turn all the i's into minus i. Omega e to the minus i phi plus R e to the minus i phi over L times the original complex number itself. So times um, i omega e to the i phi plus R e to the i phi over L. Okay. Before I go far, um, do people already see that e to the i phi will cancel out? Because I um, should have stopped and realized. Uh, I have the same e to the i phi term in both cases. So I can factor it out in both cases. e to the minus uh, i phi e to the minus i phi here, so factor it out there, times e to the i phi here, factor it out there. e to the minus i phi times e to the i phi, what's that? The exponent is zero, so one, yeah. So e to the i phi factor simply all cancels out to one. In fact, that's one of the things that this whole modulo squared thing is guaranteed to do. Now, what I'm hoping is that this minus i and i will get rid of each other as I go through the algebra. So let me, so let me do the denominator separately here. So uh, what I have is minus i omega plus r over l. Actually, let me write it the same way I wrote it here. Then I can save me some um, math here. So R over L, the real part first, minus the imaginary part, I omega. And the, the second term, the real part first, R over L plus I omega. That's the exact same thing I did here with R over L is A, omega is B. So this is equal to r squared over l squared plus omega squared. Good. Let me write that out here. Uh, new colors. I, I want to save the result here to refer to, but I can write down the simplified version of this up here. So the simplified version of this is uh, I naught squared is equal to V naught squared over L squared over um, this thing here, R squared over L squared plus omega squared. Let me simplify, you know, I have this L squared, absorb it into here. Then I have V naught squared over R squared, L squared cancels, plus omega squared, L squared. And to find the phi, I'm sorry, to find I naught, instead of I naught squared, you take the square root. When you take the square root, this is what you get, or you know, well, uh, V naught squared becomes simply V naught, and the denominator becomes denominators, you know, square rooted. Compare that with the result we got before. It's the exact same result, except it was quicker. 
uh, I didn't have to go through the whole process of expanding out cosine and sine terms, and I didn't have to do that. So this complex, uh, using complex exponential makes your algebra much simpler than it would be otherwise. So, or here's another way to put it. Um, complex exponential turns uh, trigonometric expressions into exponential expressions. So in the places where you might have had to use trigonometric identities, all you have to do is exponential algebra. It's a much simpler task you have to do. Um, for the, you know, uh, I guess the trade-off is that it is a more advanced concept. Like, you know, it does involve becoming comfortable with a complex number and maybe knowing one additional operation that's defined in the context. But so this is the second method of doing this same circuit. So in both methods, um, we get this, um, in both methods, um, this is the, this is the solution for time dependent current, something that's oscillating at omega t plus a phase factor times a magnitude. And so in the interest time, I won't do the phase factor here, but what you can see is that the magnitude works out to be the same using either of the two methods. 